Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, for those of you uh, visiting, this is our the second week back since coming home from Guatemala. We had a team that uh, I got to lead, and we went with others, and we went to Guatemala, and we did a construction missions trip. We put a roof on a pastor's house down there, and it was 95% humidity and 90 degrees, and they told us it was the coolest it ever gets, so I'm glad we went now, because <laughs> we... I felt like I was going to die, but you adjust pretty quick, so. But anyways, uh, you guys can turn in Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 12. Um, I'll let you turn there. And I was, I think a bulletin, I think I had said, uh, I don't know, 12, Mark 1, 12 through 15. But I got a little too ambitious, and uh, we're, not, we're just going to go first two verses today. So. so if you're there, Mark 1, verse 12, we'll read it together. Immediately, the Spirit drove him, that is Jesus, into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him. And so the last time we were together in Mark, which now was a month ago, um, we covered the baptism of the servant, Jesus Christ, by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And uh, it's been a month because, uh, like I said, we were gone a couple Sundays in Guatemala, and then we had a Christmas message. Um, and now we come back. It's like, wow, it's been a month. So, because of that, I'm just going to do a little recap of where, where we were. And we had looked at three reasons why Jesus was baptized. I'm sure you could probably come up with more, but we had covered three, three pretty good main reasons. First of all, as Jesus explained to John, unique from every other person coming to John to be baptized... Jesus' baptism it was not to confess any personal sin. But as Jesus said, it was to fulfill all righteousness. Remember, John tried to prevent him. He's like, you're coming to me to be baptized. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, I know. But for now, please allow it. We need to fulfill all righteousness. And so at the Jordan River... Uh, he was formally inaugurated into his office as Messiah. And he was officially recognized as such by the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove and remaining. And then audibly by the Father's declaration to Jesus. Remember, he said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so both the Spirit and the Father testified Yes, this is the Messiah. Secondly, uh, another real important reason for the baptism of Jesus, we read in John 131. And John said, I didn't know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And so the baptism uh, of Jesus was John's cue to publicly announce to Israel Hey, your long-awaited Messiah has come. He is here. And so John, the Spirit, sent him into the wilderness so that Messiah could be revealed. Remember, he said, The one on whom you see the dove descend and remain, that's the one who's mightier than you, who's, who's coming. And then the third reason we looked at for the baptism of Jesus was his identification with sinners. And we're going to look a little bit more um, on that point today. It's going to come up. <clears throat> but people were coming out of the wilderness, or they were coming out into the wilderness to, to John to confess their sin. And really, they were, they were confessing their need for a Savior to redeem them. And then Jesus, he came to identify with all those sinners wanting a Savior so that he might become their substitute. 
as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he became our substitute, and we identified with him, and he identified with us. And now that Jesus... Okay, so at this point in, in Mark, the fir this first chapter is kind of like a prologue because Mark just wants to get into Jesus, the servant of God, doing, you know, the miracles, serving others, and he just, he gets right to the point. He doesn't put very much, he doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus, you know, so it's kind of nice, it was nice we're starting Mark. And Christmas season, so we can get into the other Gospels and read from Luke, Matthew, and kind of fill in. And, you know, most of us are pretty familiar, but if you're not, you know, it's nice to have the other Gospels that give us all this information. Because if you only had Mark, and, and it's interesting, we had finished the book of Hebrews, Jesus burst onto the scene fully formed. There's no Emmanuel, there's no baby in the manger, there's no Hark the Herald Angel Sings. You know, saying he just burst on the scene, fully formed. You know, goes down, gets uh, baptized, and and moves into action. But anyways, um, now that he's been officially presented by God's designated forerunner, the herald John the Baptist, to the nation of Israel, and he's been anointed with the Holy Spirit for his ministry. Imagine that you never have read any of the other gospel accounts. You know, this, so you're reading Mark, and you've never read any other account. Now you come, to, come up to this point. What do you think the first official act in office would be for Jesus? Right? He's just been publicly uh, announced. He's been baptized, which was... They would baptize like a high priest when he became high priest and when he started, you know, he, the ceremony, they would go through the whole ceremony. And so Jesus does the same thing. That was part of fulfilling all righteousness is being inducted or, or you know, being inaugurated. And so now it's like, okay, you're, you're uh, we all officially recognize you. What's his first act? What does he do? What would you have done? Now you're Jesus Messiah. You came, you know, your job is to, uh, you know, save the world and, and reunite the lost with the Father. Would you have made your way to Jerusalem and, and started handing out your brand new Jesus Messiah business cards to the high priest and the Jewish high council at the temple? You better get down there and, you know, shake hands and pass out my card, right? Hey guys, I'm finally here. I know you've been waiting a long time. The wait's finally over. On my card, you know, check out my email. Just shoot me, shoot me an email. Let's get things rolling. You guys on board with me or what? You know? Would you have started maybe, maybe you're like, okay, well, maybe you wouldn't do that. But would you have started performing some miracles? Let's get some people's attention. Hello, I'm Jesus Messiah. I'm the Son of God. Let's start doing some miracles. Got out your Bible prophecy to-do list and your day planner. You're like, okay, these are all the prophecies I've got to fulfill. And I've got a limited time. Let's get out my day planner. And I'm going to start penciling in some times and some places and people and start fulfilling the Holy Scriptures. Okay? Would you have started signing into law some new religious bills everyone's been hoping you would pass? Slide them across your desk, start signing them into law. But seriously, what would your plan have been? And, and I think it would be safe to say that probably whatever your plan would have been um, would have been anything except what we read happens next. This, I would have not even thought of what happens. So what does happen now that Jesus has been formally and officially introduced to the nation of Israel? What did we read? 
Immediately after the baptism of Jesus, none of that other stuff happens. He doesn't go meet anybody. He doesn't do any miracles. None of that. It says the Spirit sends Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by Satan. And reading this, how many times has the question why popped into my head? You're reading along. Okay, Jesus, the forerunner, has just declared him. Jesus has just got baptized. The Father says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends upon him and remains. And he's sent out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. Ever read your Bible and think, huh, that's kind of weird. It's kind of weird that this next thing that happens. So why does this happen right here in the gospel story? Why would that be the very, it's got to have some significance if it's the very first thing that happens following the baptism of Jesus. That was no small thing. That was a big deal that happened. And so, you know, does it seem strange only to me? Or have you ever felt that way too and had some similar questions come to mind? And in our passage that we read, just those couple verses in Mark 1, we have three major characters. We have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus, and we have Satan. Those are the major characters. And out of these three people, whose idea was it for Jesus to be led into the desert to be tempted? Whose idea was it? It was the Spirit's. It was the Spirit's idea, right? And this is one of the keys to understanding this passage. This, we need to remember, because somehow we get reading and we forget, but this was not Satan's initiative. Satan did not initiate this. Otherwise, it would have said, you know, Satan came to Jesus and found him, or, or Satan enticed Jesus, or whatever, or something, right? But it has nothing to do with his initiation. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And so it still seems a little bit weird to me as I'm thinking about it. Okay, that this is not the devil's idea, but why would the Spirit send Jesus to be tempted by Satan? It's a great question. Something profound is happening. Something um, that's part of God's plan. And it's important. Before he ever calls the first disciple, before he ever walks along the shore of Galilee and starts finding fishermen, this takes place. As we explore the answer to this question, I'll, I'll start with a confession. It's not really a cop-out, but you might think it's a cop-out. But this passage is yet another reminder to me of God saying, when I read things like this and I'm sitting here trying to figure it out, my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Right? That's kind of like the exercise. If you were Jesus and you just got baptized and you got commissioned and you're the Messiah, what's the first thing you do? Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, break out, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, champagne, I don't know. Make champagne out of water. I don't know what you do. But my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, right? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or, or as his counselor taught him? Isaiah 40, 13. That's a rhetorical question. Nobody gives direction to the Spirit of the Lord. We don't give the Holy Spirit direction. Rather, from the Spirit, we are directed. Right? And in Romans it says, As many as are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. We never lead the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us. We don't give Him direction. He gives us direction. Right? Who's directed the Spirit of the Lord? And 
Interesting, even Jesus in his incarnation did not give direction to the Spirit. Even as the Son of God, Jesus did not direct the Spirit. But Jesus moved at the impulse of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit said move, Jesus moved. At once, the Spirit made him go into the desert. That's how Mark puts it. The other gospel writers, uh, Matthew and Luke, they say that the Holy Spirit led Jesus. That's what Matthew says, because he's portraying Jesus as a king. And you don't make a king do something. You lead a king, right? Maybe you lead in front of him. And then um, Luke says that he, full of the Holy Spirit, he went out to the desert. But interesting, Mark, Mark is portraying Jesus as a servant. And you make servants do things. And Jesus, in his humility, the Spirit makes him, you're going to the desert. And Jesus immediately obeys that as impulse. While our team was away on mission in Guatemala, Brother Rick preached a couple sermons from the book of Job, right? In Job 1.6, we're given a fascinating glimpse into the unseen realm of the, of the spirit where the Lord interacts with Satan and the angels who rebelled against God with, with him. Starting uh, right there, Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? It wasn't that the Lord didn't know where he was. He was saying, You answer to me. You tell me where have you been. He already knew, but it's like, I'm calling, you know, calling you on the carpet. So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And so as Satan roams around the earth, what is he doing? We're going to get to it soon in, in Sunday school, 1 Peter 5. Satan is looking for someone he may devour. And Jesus affirms this truth also in John 10.10. 10. What does he say? The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. So that's Satan roaming to the... Satan, where have you been? You know where I've been. I've been going back and forth through the earth looking for someone whom I may devour. I've been doing what I do. And the Lord said, well, hey, as you've been doing that, let me ask you a question. Have you considered my servant Job? If you're Job and you knew that, you're like, thanks a lot, Lord. <laughs> really? <laughs> Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So, and what's Satan's response uh, to God's suggestion of Job? He immediately attempts to tarnish the, the righteousness of Job. And he claims that Job only reveres God because of material gain. You say there's nobody like him? Yeah, it's because you blessed him so much. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does, God, the, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, <clears throat> and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, okay, check it out. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on his person. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And so after the conversation between the Lord and Satan, do you notice there's no hesitation whatsoever on Satan's part? He doesn't go, Oh, no, Job, Job's a pretty tough character. I don't know if I can crack. He's a pretty tough nut. I don't know if uh, I want to take this challenge on. He is pretty righteous. He is pretty blameless in his generation on the earth, one who fears God. I don't know. 
No, we don't read any of that. He immediately engages Job, is what we read in the end of chapter 1. And he begins to harass him. And that's to put it mildly, right? And throughout the remainder of the entire book, while it remains a mystery to Job, we, the reader, we know the exact reason for Job's suffering. And it's the suffering that Job struggles with for the next 36 chapters. He's trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Why has this, what has he done? And he maintains his innocence. And it wasn't because Job was unrighteous and that he was reaping the consequences of sin in his life that he was suffering. But rather, it was because he was righteous. And God allowed Satan to prove that Job loved and feared God. Not because of all the material wealth and blessing that God had blessed him with. But because of who he is. Job knew that the Lord was worthy of all honor and praise. And that's why he feared him. Of course, he was you know, grateful for all the blessings. After learning about the destruction of all his, his livestock and the death of his seven sons and three daughters by the hand of Satan, Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Naked I came from my mother's womb, this is what he says, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in the heavenly scene, be God saying, I'll prove to you that there, there are those who love and obey and worship me because they're seeking the face of God and not just the hand of God. See, Job doesn't just love me because I opened my hand and blessed him. Job seeks my face no matter what. And in that, in that heavenly scene, how much glory do you think God received through Job's amazing declar declaration of faith and his surrender to God's will for his life? What did Job also say? He said this was amazing. Something for us to remember going through difficult times. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips, the Bible says. Who initiated Job's trial? Whose idea was it for him to be tested? It wasn't Satan's, was it? Satan did not initiate this trial. It was the Lord who put Satan up to it. He suggested him to Satan for the trial of his character and his person. Job found himself in this circumstance because he was righteous and God wanted to prove that he truly was righteous and for the right reasons. And so it was with Jesus. At the direction of the Spirit, Jesus was sent into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In Matthew's account, we're told that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry, and then the tempter came to him with the first temptation. Anytime we come to the number 40 in the Bible, it should grab our attention. The number 40 generally represents a period of testing or trial. And I believe I read somewhere there was like 146 references to 40 in this usage in the Bible. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights during the great flood that destroyed the ancient world, of which only Noah and his family survived in the ark. Moses was 40 days on Mount Sinai receiving the law of God and the Ten Commandments. The 12 spies sent um, to spy out the land of Canaan. They were there 40 days spying out the land before they brought the report back. The prophet Jonah, how many days do you think he preached to Nineveh? He said 40 days and it would be destroyed. 
And there's, there's lots of other instances we can mention. But I want to give you one more. How many days did the giant of Gath, Goliath, present himself to and defy the army of Israel before David accepted his challenge? Forty days, the Bible says, morning and evening. So, so Goliath was doing two a days. He get up in the morning, get his cup of coffee, and defy the army of Israel and mock them. And then before he went to bed, he would do it and warm his little heart in, in, in mocking Israel. And who was the aggressor in that situation? Who was the aggressor between Israel and the Philistines? Goliath, right? And why did the trial last 40 days? No one, including Saul, was willing to engage the giant in single hand-to-hand -hand combat until David showed up. You know, the Bible said he was like, what, like nine foot tall and just huge. And, and so day after day, this drags on 40 days because no one was like, I'm not going out there. I'm going to get squashed until David shows up. Now, in the temptation of Jesus... Let me ask a critical question. Who do you think was the aggressor in this situation? Who do you think was the aggressor? Not, not Satan. It was Jesus. Remember, first of all, whose idea was this in the first place? Was it Satan's idea? No, the spirit sent Jesus to be tempted. He sends him to Satan to be tempted. It was the Spirit's idea. Let me ask another question. Why did the confrontation last 40 days? Because just like the army of Israel before Goliath, the devil did not want to engage Jesus. We read in 1 Samuel, when Saul and all Israel heard the challenge of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. That's why they didn't engage. They were terrified. When the Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, who do you think was dismayed and greatly afraid? Can you imagine Jesus fasting for 40 days and nights? Nothing to eat, only his fingernails to chew on. I'm sure I'm hungry out here. Yeah, the Lord's Spirit set me out here. Nothing to eat. All I have is my fingernails to chew off. I'm dreading the moment when Satan's going to finally pop out of the bushes and tempt me to sin. Oh man, I can't take this anymore. The suspense is killing me. Can you imagine Jesus? Out there in the desert doing that. Terrified, greatly dismayed, afraid. No way. But what do we see as we study and we really look at this passage? Jesus, perfectly at peace, and his spirit sustained through prayer and fasting. Waiting. Do you realize Jesus was waiting for the adversary to finally engage him? Perhaps in the unseen realm of the Spirit for 40 days, morning and evening, the Lord challenged Satan. Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Jesus? That there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Maybe he reminded, you know, we just got through... Uh, Christmas season and reading some of those passages, maybe the Father reminded Satan, you tried to destroy Jesus like a coward when Jesus was just a baby. Remember when you moved Herod to massacre all the male children who were born in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had learned from the wise men? 
He's like, do you think Herod just acted on his own that he wanted to destroy baby Jesus? Or do you think he was moved by Satan and a plan to destroy the Messiah before Messiah could, could grow up? He's like, wow. Have you considered Jesus? Yeah, you, you were real tough when he was a baby, but now you're unwilling to engage him face to face. Dwight Pentecost writes, and I would agree, since Christ was under the full control of the Spirit, and since the purpose of the temptation was to demonstrate his sinlessness and thus prove his moral right to be the Savior Sovereign, we must recognize that Jesus was the aggressor in the temptation. He forced Satan to put him to the test so that his true character might be revealed. That explains why he spent 40 days in the desert before the temptations began. Satan sought to escape the confrontation. Had there been a longer delay, it would have been a concession that Jesus was the sinless one. It's like, if you go beyond 40 days and you don't, an there's no answer, you've already answered. I mean, that's the answer, right? Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, and this is uh, reading out of Matthew, Matthew 4. When the tempter came to Jesus, he said, if you're the son of God, or since you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up into the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written. He's like, oh, you want to quote scripture? I'll quote you scripture. He tries this. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, It's written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory in a moment of time. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. That was not before 3 through 11. So, but, you know, for this morning, as far as handling uh, the specifics of the three temptations, I'm not going to get into that this morning and how Jesus responded to each one. I'm going to save that for next week and do like a two-part because it's too much and I don't want to rush through that. But I want to look at one final question this morning. One which would explain the devil's reluctance to reveal Christ's perfect character through a direct encounter with him. The devil was not very interested in, in having this direct encounter with Jesus, but I believe that he was. It is interesting, the spirit was the one who orchestrated this and led him to be tempted by the devil. And so this was... An encounter that was going to happen by God's God's will. And here's the question that's been raised. And I want you, I don't want to lose you when I go through this. And, and we've talked about this before. If, if, if we weren't in church and this wasn't, you could call it the Bible or religion or theology, whatever you want to call it, the Word of God. If this was some, if we were exploring some other um, field, whatever it is. Every field and every expertise has its terms and terminology, and we would be okay with that. And I don't like when people say, oh, it's Christianese. These are important words, and so I think we should, if we are gonna give that to every other category, whether it's a hobby or a profession, or we're going to school, you go down to MJC, I guarantee that they're gonna have specific terms and no one's going to poo-poo the terms 
And so I think it's okay that we have terms that have great meaning to take a little time. So I just want to preface that, you know, as we get into this. And this is the question that's been raised by, by Orthodox theologians. They go back and forth. Was the sinlessness of Christ the same as that of Adam before the fall? So was Jesus the same as Adam before he fell into sin? Or did he possess a peculiar character because of the presence of the divine nature? So in other words, could the Son of God be tempted as Adam was tempted? And could he have sinned the same way that Adam sinned? And the point of view that Christ had the ability to sin is designated by the term peccability. And the doctrine that Christ could not sin is referred to as the impeccability of Christ. And it's interesting, if any of you speak Spanish, pecador is sin. And pecadores is sinners. But that's the same, you go back to Latin, it's the same, whether it's Spanish or English, it's the same Latin root word of impeccable, peccability, or pecador in Spanish. It's the same, same thing. He's talking about sin. And those who hold both views agree. The one thing they don't, there's no dispute that Christ did not sin. Whether they believe he could or was incapable, they both, it's obvious he did not sin. But those who affirm peccability hold that he could have sinned, whereas those who de declare the impeccability of Christ believe that he could not sin due to the <coughs> presence of the divine nature. And the question, this is where they have the beef concerning the impeccability of Christ has to do whether or not he could be tempted in a proper sense. So basically, if you're incapable of sinning, if someone tempts you, is that like a real temptation? Or is that just like doesn't count? You know what I mean? That's where they kind of have this disagreement. All agree that Christ had a human nature. And because of that, yes, he could be tempted. But what is unique to Christ is that he had two natures, one divine one human. And we see that in Christmas, right? In the incarnation. He was the son of man. Mary was his physical, earthly mother. But the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And so, you know, the Father, he had a divine, a divine nature um, by the Holy Spirit. But scripture, you know. Scripture plainly tells us that Jesus was tempted. We studied that in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we know that Jesus was tempted. Here's the other interesting part. Scripture also tells us in James that God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither does he tempt anyone. And so on one hand, Christ was tempted in all points the exact same way through, um, he was tempted in every way we were except for one. He didn't have a fallen nature. When we're tempted, we already have a sin nature that's prone. So when we're tempted, we're like, that sounds good. I want to do that. Right? Because we're already dispositioned that way. So Christ was tempted in every way except there was nothing inside. There was no sinful nature like we have. And that's the only, that would be the only difference. He couldn't be tempted from within. We're tempted from within. He could only be tempted from without. And we could be tempted both ways. In and out, we're like, oh man, we better be reading our Bibles and praying. Because we have a sin nature that can be tempted, right? On the other hand, his divine nature could not be tempted because God cannot be tempted. And so while his human nature is temptable, his divine nature is not. 
And this is pretty, pretty awesome. It's the paradox of the God-man of Jesus coming, God the Son coming in an earthly body, right? And so the real question, it simply becomes this. Is it possible to attempt to attempt the impossible? Can people attempt, is it possible to attempt something that's impossible? Would you say yes or no? Can you attempt something that's impossible? Yeah, of course you can, right? Is it possible for a rowboat to attack a battleship? Yes, it's possible. But what are the odds of a successful attack? It's virtually impossible. So a rowboat could go out and try to take on a naval battleship, but the odds are pretty much zero that there's going to be any success. And so the temptation is real. But if there's infinite power to resist the temptation, now we're talking about Jesus. Do you think the temptation that Satan brought to Jesus was real? When he gave those three temptations, was that a real temptation? It wasn't a powerful temptation. Yes. But his power to resist was infinite in the divine nature and therefore it was impossible for him to sin Jesus fully possessed two natures at the same time and sometimes we can get one way or the other right it's kind of easy for we kind of it's a hard concept it's a it's a divine mystery the incarnation and so sometimes we kind of move back and forth where we think we're thinking of Jesus more as a man and now over here, we're like, oh no, he's the son of God, he's doing miracles. And we kind of go back and forth, but we kind of don't always grasp that he's both fully at the same <coughs> time. But here's the thing, though he possessed two natures the whole time, he never operated in his humanity independent of his divine nature. He didn't just say, hey, I'm... He never said, oh, I'm just operating as a man now. And then he went, oh, I'm going to do a few miracles. Hang on, self, whatever. Okay, now I'm going to be divine, I'm, you know, do these things. He never operated independently. He was both at the same time. And because of that, his sinless human nature was always surrendered to his divine nature. The human nature was always in surrender to the spirit. And so when the devil tried tempting Jesus, he was attempting the impossible. Satan was the rowboat trying to conquer the battleship. Is it any wonder he drug his feet 40 days? <laughs> it's like, this is impossible. Even with my, my strongest best temptations when, when Satan tempted Adam in the garden though he originally originally Adam had a sinless human nature right when he was created he was created perfect he had never sinned he had a human nature that was perfect something that we haven't experienced right but because he had no divine nature to sustain him he was both temptable and peckable. He had the ability to sin. Which, how many, how many temptations did Satan have to use on Adam before he fell? Did he have to do three? He One, right? The very first temptation we read about. He has a perfect, sinless human nature. And the very first temptation... Without the divine power to sustain him, he falls. Adam and Eve fall to the deceitfulness of Satan. And then in the case of Job, he didn't have a sinless human nature. He had a sinful 
human nature. Because Job is a descendant of Adam and Eve, and every descendant has a sin nature. And so we come to Job, who has a sin nature. He was peccable. He had the ability to sin. And during the attack of Satan upon him, what was the difference? The, su the sufficient grace of God. He was able to withstand the temptation. The temptation for him was what his wife suggested. Why don't you just curse God and die? You're stricken of God. You're cursed. Just curse God and die. And in all he suffered, the Bible says he didn't sin with his lips. And so what is sufficient grace or what is sufficient power? It's the ability to not sin through God's divine strengthening and spirit. And as wonderful as this is for us, and it's necessary, that's what we must have to not sin and to withstand the, the temptations and the, the fiery darts of Satan. We must have sufficient grace and sufficient power. As wonderful as that is, how much inferior to the power Christ possessed in the divine nature. There's no comparison, is there, to the power that Christ possessed. He was omnipotent. He was almighty. Because he was almighty, he was impeccable. He could not sin. You realize that it was an impossibility for Jesus to sin? If God can't be tempted, and Jesus is God, the Son of God, then it's an impossibility, and his human nature is surrendered to the divine nature. It's an impossibility for him. It wasn't like God was up there sweating it, going, I wonder if I just messed up big time. And I led Jesus by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And this might end really badly. You know, he wasn't sweating it. And so the temptation of Jesus was not a test or trial to see whether he would sin or not. But this was a revelation to the devil. Your power is about to be forever broken through the cross of the sinless one. The devil was shaking in his boots because he had come up face to face with Jesus, the perfect man with the divine nature, the God man. In Hebrews it says, Inasmuch then as the children, that's you and I, have partaken of flesh and blood. We got flesh and blood, right? He himself, that is Jesus, likewise shared in the same. That's Christmas. Jesus came and shared in the flesh and blood. That's his birth, right, at Christmas. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil, as he stared into Jesus' eyes through the three temptations and was defeated, he knew that it was just a matter of time when his power was going to be destroyed and broken. That's why he didn't want to have that confrontation. There was nothing he could do anyways about it. And beyond that, this temptation of Jesus, it was a further means of identification with us. Reading further in Hebrews. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like you and I, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. How fascinating. I mean, have you ever read and approached this temptation of Jesus like, ooh, man, this was, this was a close one. This was, whoa, what if things went the wrong way? You know? It's why it's, it's important to understand and study our theology and understand when the Bible says that he was fully God yet he was fully man there are wrapped up in that our eternal salvation is wrapped up in that and that's why it was you know it was as sure as could be that we were that Jesus 
That's why we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, Jesus, when he came into the world, he said, you've prepared for me a body. And in the volume of the book, it's written about me. And behold, I come to do your will. It was guaranteed. Yeah, he was fully human. He partook of flesh and blood like you and I. And then he was tempted. Although the temptation was, it was a real temptation, but it could have never succeeded. You know, it's, it's like those who would say the temptation wasn't really valid, it wasn't really real. It's like saying, just because an army can't be conquered, does it mean it can't be attacked? Jesus was an army that could not be conquered, yet he was attacked. But the reality is that it could have no effect, it could never succeed. And so that's why you see Jesus so peaceful, fasting and praying in the wilderness. He just waiting. You realize he wasn't even hungry until he he's just having pure fellowship with God in connection with the Father. And it says after that he was hungry and the devil came and they had this encounter. And so your salvation it's been secure since the foundation of the world. It was never at jeopardy in the wilderness. And so God sends Jesus into the wilderness kind of like when he did with Job. Hey, have you ever thought you ever tried Job? If you think that went bad, you want to try Jesus? And it was, <laughs> you know, it, it put Satan to open shame. And I think when we come to these other encounters of Jesus with the demonic in Mark, we're going to come to a number of encounters with the demonic. What do they do? I think it gives us some insight into why they shriek with fear and terror. Look how easily Jesus handled Satan. And we're going to go into how he did it, but not today. But if their if they're master, the lord of the demons, you know, Satan was so easily defeated. No wonder every time Jesus shows up. Have you come to destroy us before the time? They're doomed. But our salvation is, it couldn't be more secure in Jesus. Steve, if you, if you want to come up. Christmas is, there's so much, there's so many layers when you really start looking at it. And just even opening up your Bible and reading and studying, looking at the awesome person of Jesus who came in that manger. He was the one who would stand face to face with Satan and uh, effortlessly, uh, you know, defeat him. And that's who our Savior is. And that's why we worship him. You know, he came, he conquered, and he's going to lead us into heaven one day. All of us who put our faith in him, we're going to stand with our brother Jesus and be presented to the Lord in heaven. And what an awesome day that's going to be. If you're watching on YouTube, you know, I'm pretty sure every person in this room has put their faith and trust in Christ. If you haven't, come and talk to me afterwards. Talk to any of us and pray. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, put your faith and trust in Jesus. What are you waiting for? He came to save and, and love you and bring you to heaven.
how good you are. You've taken our place. You've taken our place and you've made a way where there was no way for us. But you made the way. You were able, as the God-man, to resist all the temptation to come out of there with all the authority in heaven and in earth. Lord, you, you came out of the grave when you finished your work. And you said those words, all authority, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Now I'm telling you, go. Go wherever you go. And let people know. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise, Lord, because you made a way for us. You took our place, and you've given us a divine power through the Holy Spirit, divine nature, to escape the corruption in the world. And Lord, we thank you for your love today. We thank you for your grace. Let these words sink deep in our hearts, and let them become reality to us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen.